I'll, I'll begin by asking you to give us your name. And just, just tell us your full name. I am Jim Reuter of the Society of Jesus. Arthur Francis J. Bill Kreutz. Edmundo Martinez. Francis H. Clark. John Krebs. Luigi Moji. Arthur Andrew Bauer. Miguel Anselmo Bernat. My name is uh, Honesto. My middle name is Chavez. And his name Pagana. I'm Roque Angel Ferriol's Diamias. As you, we be asking you to give us your full name, where you were born, when you, uh, when you were born. Yeah. My name is Jean Desautel. I uh, was born in Montreal, the province of Quebec in Canada, of uh, French descent. My ancestors came to Canada in 1653, so I'm a real Canadian of French descent. And uh, I was educated there. I joined the Society of Jesus when I was 18 years old. And after seven years, I volunteered. I volunteered to go to China. Then I was sent to China in uh, 19, 1939. And uh, went to, you see, if you volunteer for the mission in my province, they usually at the time of the Regency, they give you this time of regency to go there to learn the language and maybe start teaching. And if there is a theologate in that area, then you are following your Jesuit studies. So after my philosophy, I went to, I went to Beijing to the language school for two years. We were giving the option, three years of language study or two years of language studies and one year of regency. I took regency because at that time I had the privilege of spending two months of, after my first year of Chinese language in a seminary, a Jesuit seminary, where only Chinese were there. I was the only foreigners particularly there. So for two months, I had the privilege of speaking Chinese. So I did my regency in China in a small school in the center of China. And then for the war broke when I was there in 1942. And, uh, and at the summer of 42, I was permitted by the Japanese because I was considered as an enemy of the Japanese people. I was permitted to go to Shanghai to undertake my theological studies. So I stayed there for four years. The war ended in 45. We had more, one more year, then went back to Canada for tertianship. And after tertianship, I was asked to stay in Canada and start the mission bureau there with another Jesuit who was succeeding the old man who had started it. So I stayed there for one year with him. I asked the provincial, who was the superior of the mission, not to keep me there too long. I didn't want to lose my Chinese. So he said, no, one year. So by nine, after my tuition trip. So in November, in November, I was assigned, actually, to be the rector and director of the language school in Beijing to leave uh, Montreal November 1st, take a boat with another, an, an, an American, Father Murphy, who is now at Tian Center in, uh, in Taipei. We were, he had booked us on the American warship because at that time there were no more commercial ships going to China because of the danger of the war with the communists. On November 1st, the day I was supposed to leave, 
We had a big despedida in my mother's place. And I got a cable from the provincial of my province who was in Beijing telling me not to leave because the communists were taking over. So instead of leaving, I stayed in Canada. And then I asked the, provin the acting provincial, since I was going to be the director of the language school, why not allow me to take, to kill time? We always talk, you know, three months we go back to China, four months maximum. Allow me to follow some courses in one of the American universities on uh, linguistic. So I enrolled at Harvard and I start uh, master's degree studies on Chinese history and, Ch and linguistic, and I took uh, also advanced courses on fast reading in Chinese newspaper. And I was accepted. I entered Harvard January 1st, 1949. And I moved to Boston, and I was staying in uh, Newbury Street, which is the house where all the students and they in Boston area were staying. And I was with Horacio de la Costa there for about four, four months or something like that. And since we were the only new two non-Americans, we were ganging together. <laughs> so, and I remember Horacio de la Costa was the only one who could adjust the television. At that time was the beginning of television. And also the world, when the world was mixed up, they would ask Horacio, come and adjust our thing, and he would do it. You know? So I was there until, May 1949, when I got a letter from Father General telling me that uh, since the language school in Beijing had been closed, he wanted it reopened by October 1st, 1949, somewhere in, uh, somewhere in Asia. So that's the time I said, well, where do we go? Asia, I knew only China. So I, would, I went to Jesuit mission in New York. And I spoke with a man, which John Coleman was the mission procurator there. And I asked him, what would you do if you would do that? He said, language school, I would start in Monterey in California. Because there, the uh, Americans have their language school there. And there's a house there belonging to the Jesuit, which is used only during summer. And they have 60 rooms you could use there because there were 54 missionaries from 14 different countries who had been assigned to China. And that was what the Father General was saying in his letter. I don't want them to be reintegrated in their province. I want them out of their province. And I want the provincial to get them back. So they have to start studying the language somewhere. And that was my assignment just then. then. So I went to California. The provincial was willing to let us use the house. But Father General said no. It has to be Asia. So then I uh, wonder where I would go. And at that time, I heard there were some missionaries coming from China who were in, already in the Philippines. Father O'Hara, for instance, an American, I learned that from Jesuit mission, was looking for a house for 120 seminarians who were coming from the Qingxian mission where Father Ginter come from. And they, they were waiting, they were in China, preparing to come here. And in the, also there was a group of novices, Jesuit novices, Chinese, and Jesuit uh, juniors, who were already here. And they were uh, uh, living in Baguio, in, in the private houses of parents of the Jesuits in the Philippines. So I phoned Oara and said, could you find a house for me? So he said, well, we will be looking. And he was telling me at that time, Father Borkhart, who was the overall superior of the Jesuit group, was as asked him to look for a house big enough that would put the two group together. So he said, he, I have an, a, a possibility of renting uh, a compound in Los Banos that belonged to the uh, Philippine Long Distance Telephone Company. So if that could be arranged, we will have, a, it's just like a summer house with many villas, and then we could, uh, we could there uh, be all together. So I waited, when I phoned him, it was already June, July nothing, August I phoned him and he said, well, 
you better come and help me because I cannot find a place. So that's why I left the end of August and landed here in the Philippines. At that time, it took four days, you know, from California to come here. We were st stopping, at, uh, stopping in uh, Hawaii and then Guam and uh, then Philippines. So when I arrived there, Sept I arrived here September 1st, 1979. Exactly 50 years ago. 79, Father. 79, 79, yeah. 79 yes. 49, you mean? Uh, 49, I'm sorry. Uh, so when did you arrive here, Father? September 1st, 1940. I arrived in September 1st, 1949. Yeah. Father, you, why did you volunteer to go to China in the first place? Well, I, when I joined the society, it was to be a missionary. And then our province had two options, either to, to go to uh, among the Indians in Kautnawaga, which was a, a, a camp for, for uh, the in, um, North American Indians there, or to go to China, because that was our mission field. Huh? Mm -hmm. So that's why I, uh, I volunteered for China. But um, when you heard the news that you were not going back to China, how did you feel about that? Well, we all said it was a question of months. Huh? None of us believed that the communists were be able to stay in China because they felt the philosophy of communism is so against the mentality of the Chinese. Eh? So we had no, at uh, that time at least, I did not believe they would, they would stay. And it, in China, I was always under the Japanese also during the whole war. I, when I went to China, the Japanese already occupied all the, the cities on the, on the coast. Eh? So we entered in, in Shanghai and they were received by the Japanese sentries and soldiers. And so we were saying it's the same, you know, the communists will not take, will not stay, or if they stay, finally they will let us come back. So when you came to Manila, you were not, you didn't think it was going to be a permanent thing? Oh, no, not at all. That's why when we started the language school, we started in those uh, prefab, prefabricated huts, you know, that uh, it was a field hospital that we bought and then we had transformed it into uh, bedrooms and so forth. But we, we bought all the, the quonset or the prefab uh, huts that were there, 24 of them, I think. They were all in a very nice compound or on board, uh, elevated, you know, from the ground about, about almost three-fourths of a meter. And uh, there was electricity, water, it was a, uh, the easiest way to find a place, you know, for 200 people. <laughs> that uh, we will say it's a joke when somebody said, find a house, you know, between the month of May and, uh, and the 1st of October for 60 people. Where do you find that in, uh, in Asia? Well, well, I think it was God's providence that directed us capable. Father Colum at that time was a superior and helped us very much. He himself, like us, would not, did not like the fact that we would start the seminary in language school in that, uh, under the circumstances of the, those prefabricated arts in the military camp. Huh? And at that time also it looks like more a prisoner of war camp because it has been used to keep the Japanese in concentration camp before they would be repatriated. So when we wrote to the general, for instance, that on, I remember September 5 or 6, we cannot find anything. We, we will uh, go back to Ontario for the language school and the uh, seminarians will stay where they are. They were on Ar Araneta farm, very near Novaliches there was uh, landed to us uh, when uh, they, they wanted to evacuate that place so the scholastics could come there. So we decided the scholastic would stay in Baguio for the time being, then the seminary would stay in the farm, and uh, the language school would go to Monterey. So we wrote a long letter to the to signed by Bhadi Khanam, said, uh, I strongly recommend that the language school go to Monterey. The general answered back, you know, it was uh, tel Telex at that time. And no, India, if you, and, uh, no, not India, Asia. If you cannot uh, stay in the Philippines, try Indonesia. So when we said that, we said, well, it was already uh, 
September, we might as well just stay there. So immediately we start transforming the buildings and I will help establish the whole seminary before the language school students would come. So the seminarians moved in by mid-October and the language school students start arriving November 1st and 2nd and so forth. Why don't you describe to us those first few months in the language school? First of all, what, where was it located? How did it look? And then, uh, how, how was life like in that language school? Yeah, we, like I was saying, we started the language school in the uh, field hospital built by the Americans to receive the, the soldiers that be wound, wound, would be wounded when they would invade Japan. So it was a big, big uh, military camp. What we bought was only a small section. The rest have been completely dismantled. Where was this located exactly? It was like, located in, at that time we could, we called it Mandaluyong outside. Because inside is the, you know, <laughs> the joke, with it. it's in Mandaluyong outside. It was located where uh, Pavedas, you know where Pavedas is now? There's a road that is next to the building going inside the, the property there. That was a gravel road at that time, about a kilometer from um, MacArthur Highway at that time, which is Edza now. Is it uh, Edza? Yes. That goes inside. And the, the, the camp we bought would be where the Binget building is at present, in most um, like Ortigas uh, Center in that area in front of, uh, well, the telephone company there. Yeah. How is life like there in this language school? And what At that time, well, you know, remember the circumstances. 120 seminarians from China. We were, it's right after the war in 1499. When we came here, the post office was not completely fixed. You could see the bombs, potholes and everything. Even the city hall was in ruins, you know. So it was, uh, and the Jesuit of Ateneo were living under Quonset huts. Eh? So that's why the column would say, well, if we can live there, those would be able to live there. So Father Burkhardt was a tough missionary, still alive, <coughs> was saying, well, we're all exiled and refugees, so we will be living like refugees. Eh? So, yeah, and we decided that there would be one kitchen, one type of food, the same level for everybody, same condition, the foreigners and the Chinese. So I think it was tougher for the young child, foreigners who were coming there, mainly those who had not known the war, huh? those who had lived in Europe, for instance, for them, <laughs> that was not, not, not too much. So, so the, the life was uh, really hard because of the heat, you know, and the Quonset hut and the type of studies, and especially, I would say, speaking for the language school, those who were coming here, there were, some were after two years novitiate, some were after taking their PhD degrees, you know. So the difference of age was great among the 60, about the 50 people who were there. These are all Jesuits, Father. All Jesuit, only Jesuit for the language school, the other one only Chinese seminarians from various parts of China. The seminarians that were there at that time are now Monsignor Liu, and then they are celebrating the 50th anniversary of their coming in the Philippines. They arrive April 2nd, 1979. 19 well, there's an interesting story behind the name of the language school, isn't there? Why don't you tell us about that? Well, the, the, yes, it is interesting to know that uh, the language school was called Shabanel Hall in Beijing because Shab Noel Shabanel is one of the North American martyrs who was in Canada for a long time, was killed there, and he could not study the language, so he made a vow that even if he did not learn, he would stay in Canada. So that's why the, the, the founder of Shabanel Hall in Beijing gave that name to the language school, because he would be the patron of the students. So we kept that name here, so that they, they were coming to Shabanel Hall to study the language, hoping that within two or three months, they would go to Beijing. We did not realize that it was. But this house that was started and was found so hard to live in at the beginning, 
stayed there 18 years. Don't forget that. 18 years, it helped the China province first to finish all the uh, priesthood of the seminarians. Then it became a part of the philosophy. And then, and then the Tertian ship, and it was when the, the, the father were coming from China to work among the Chinese in the Philippines, went to Iloilo or to Cebu. They would always be there. That would be the, the center, uh, recep reception center of the Jesuit coming out of China. Father, among the younger Jesuits who lived there, uh, the, the, the school had a slightly different name, didn't it? I think among the younger scholastics who, who were there, yeah, they called it by a slightly different name because of the heat. And oh, the they were the, the joke was Shabanel Ho, Shabanel Ho. They changed it to Shaban, Shabana, Shabanel um, Hell, the, and the Chinese cemetery. <laughs> Why is that, Father? Why did they call it that? Well, because it was hard living there. You know, it was like hell actually. The heat, you know, uh, and there was no no tree under those buildings. Huh? So it was really hard for them. Eh? So they would say Shabbatol Hell instead of Shabbatol Hall. But the one, the, 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 the joke that I heard that I <laughs> enjoy very much is uh, Father, uh, brother, brother Dio or something like that. An old, old brother came one day driving from San Jose Seminary. And San Jose Seminary at that time was on what we call Highway 54 near Calo Khan there. He became a uh, hospital afterwards, I think. He came and he said, uh, is this China Bell Hall? <laughs> so, <laughs> and we were all working in the garden at that time. So it was hard work because, they, uh, like Father Burkhardt was saying, we have the same life as the Chinese. Eh? And the Chinese have no servants, so we have to keep the place clean. And actually, you know, all of us had had very tough uh, novitiate also, where we were all, always war working in the field and taking care of everything we never had. So we we did not find, we did not, the whole people, I think, did not realize that it could be hard for the younger generation the way it was. So, Father, as I said, um, it would be good maybe if you can sort of describe the process as much as you can, the process of how slowly the Jesuits here the missionaries from China, the two types. Uh, for, why don't you talk to me about that first? The two types of Jesuits who came here. Uh, when I phoned to Father O'Hara, he was already looking for a place for the seminarians. But there were also priests who came here to work among the Chinese, like Father uh, Barboa and and then I, from there, then as, as the, chain, the uh, old missionaries were expelled, many of them volunteered to come here. At that time, Taiwan was opening also. So the missionaries went to Taiwan and some of them came to the Philippines. And they started working like Iloilo and then Cebu. And uh, here, uh, Father Boraga came. But I'm speaking now of 1950, 1951. The first group came here were like refugees. And after we came here, we discovered that there was a lot of possibilities of continuing our mission work among non-Catholic Chinese Filipinos. So this went on until we discovered that uh, this was a monopoly here in the Philippines. You could not baptize any Chinese in the Manila area except with the, author the authorization of the Dominicans. I remember that I was at Chabanel. I came, like I said, in September 1949. January 1950, uh, first, well, let's say the end of December 1949, I was, you know, we had started doing some work here in Manila, especially for the O'Hara and then uh, Father uh, Papilla was working also among the Chinese youths. Eh? So I was invited to baptize two young ladies who were related to the leader of the Chinese community here in the Yoke Tai and family. So the niece of, uh, of Yoke Tai also, who was a Protestant, his father and mother were the, the pillar actually of the Baptist church in Manila. 
she was studying at Holy Ghost Convent. And uh, since she's six or seven years old, she, she wanted to receive communion. She wanted to receive Jesus in the Eucharist, which she could not do on the Baptist church. So she was pestering her parents to be baptized. And of course, for them, that was tremendous humiliation, you know, that their daughters would be converted to Catholicism. The older sisters were already married to a minister of the church, you know. But then, <laughs> when I, that when she was told that her cousin were going to be baptized at Holy Ghost Convent on January 1st, 1950, she pestered her mother. She said, I don't want any Christmas gift for the rest of my life. Give me this gift to be baptized today. So they were annoyed. They said, okay, do what you want. You're, she, she was, what, 18 or 19 at that year. So immediately through a lady by the name of Stella Yen, who was working with Father O'Hara, they came to me and they asked, would you accept her? I said, of course I would accept, I would accept her. Then they said, but we, want, we have to go and pass the test in Tondo, in Binondo. So they went to see the Dominicans there. They were interviewed. But she was always first in religion, you know, the, all at, at Holy Ghost since she was in grade school, high school, and college. <laughs> so she passed with flying colors. So the next day, uh, New Year's Day, I baptized her. But you know, she had to make an abjuration. You baptize on their condition. If you're not baptized, I baptize you. If she would have been not baptized, she wouldn't have to make a confession. That was this tricky thing. <laughs> then, since we were baptizing her under condition, she made her confession. And then I realized immediately, I didn't know him at all. Huh? I had never met her before the day when she came for baptism. But during the conversation of, uh, of and the conversation, I realized that she was not an ordinary uh, type of Christian, you know. So I told her, I said, uh, uh, you're going to receive communion now. You ask Jesus, what does he want to you? Why, why is it that he is after you for so many years for you to be baptized? You ask him. So two or three days after she phoned me, I was still at Shabanel, and she said, you know the question I asked the Lord? I said, yeah. He said, he told me, you want me to be a nun, <laughs> a contemplative nun. So I said, okay. So he came to see me. We talked about it. I said, when did he tell you that? She said, after the dinner, you know, we all, all the family on New Year's went to see a movie. During the whole movie, I did not hear anything except the Lord telling me, you know, I want you, Margaret. I want you, Margaret. You will be a nun. You will dedicate all your life to me. And I was uh, like that during the whole movie. Now what do we do? <laughs> so I said, well, let's prepare your parents because that would be a shock also. <laughs> so this took some time. But she is now the prioress of the Carmel in, in Chunglin in Taiwan. She was be about 55, 50, maybe to 60. She's been in the Carmel there. She, that's another interesting story. The Carmel was started by uh, Father um, O'Brien. The one who is in Chiang Mai now. Excuse me, Father. Who play music? Liederman. Okay. Excuse me, I'll just check on the music. Father, you mentioned that the at the time when you were working with the Chinese here, that the Dominicans had come some kind of monopoly. Can you discuss that, Father? The uh, the only thing I discovered was that uh, so many Chinese wanted to become Christian, baptized, to be a, to have a, a Catholic wedding. So they did not want to to just baptize anybody. So that's why the, I think the, the agreement was with Rome, that they would be the one checking. Because at that time, even the Jesuit, the SVD, anyone over there, were not interested at all in the Chinese apostolate. Eh? They had enough to do with, with their work. But the Dominicans were, they had the China province, the Lorenzo Ruiz group eh, was there. So they were uh, the one taking care of the Chinatown, where they were. And then they, this, that's why Rome was asking them to, for them to have some kind of a control. It was a monopoly, not because they, in, they really want to reserve it to them, but to, just to make sure that the things were taken care of uh, seriously. You know? But then when we started working, like for the Ohio with the China's group, then people went to Iloilo. Then, uh, not, no, let's say, let's say when the nuncio heard 
to, for instance, missionaries from China, Jesuit, SVDs, Franciscan, the, uh, also the foreign missionaries of Paris were coming here, and they were all Chinese missionary. The nuncio said, we have to start something among the Chinese. So that was the origin of St. Jude Parish, the ruin of St. Peter's. St. Peter was started by the French missionaries from Paris. And then came the uh, World Tondo kept up, and Borga started the, the parish here and uh, married the Queen. In well, why don't you tell us a bit about that? How was Mary the Queen started? How did it begin? How was it established? Well, Father Borga came especially for that, to start the Chinese province when the nuncio asked us to take a parish. And uh, he came and was very enthusiastic about it, and he found, uh, he uh, rented the house in Passy, 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 the Passy, uh, Libertad Street there. He rented a two-story building, he used the ground floor, was part of a garage, he rented it into a chapel, and this is where he started. He started this, uh, the date I would know exactly, what I could rebuild it. We started the school in 50, he started in 55, 54, 55, in Passy, in Passy, let's put it this way. And then uh, developed, and the St. Jude started almost the same time, and started with the school there also. St. Peter started the school much later, much later. Linondo, we had always good relationship with uh, the Dominicans, they're the, they were not offended at all that uh, that I know of, huh? that they were they were asked to let other people take care of the Chinese apostolate. Father, you're considered as one of the founders of Xavier School. So why don't you tell us about how you got involved in this, how the initiative began? Where did the initiative begin to start a Xavier School? Well, uh, when I was in uh, Shabanel, we had many contacts with the Chinese. Now, some Chinese were graduates from the Ateneo. I remember especially two who were also working with Father Wilman at that time, who was the head of the Knights of Columbus. And they were saying, well, since the Chinese missionaries are coming out of China, and many of them come from schools that they have there, you know, they were saying, we uh, Ateneo alumni always were dreaming that if we could have an Ateneo for the Chinese, where we would continue, we would keep our culture, keep our language, and then get the same good training that the ordinary uh, students get from Ateneo, La Salle, San Beda, then our boys could be accepted at college like, like we were accepted at college. Now, you know, if we want our boys to, to keep the their language, they have to go to Chinese school. Chinese school always start by Chinese and start English only two years after, and they're never very proficient in that, and then they have a hard time to be admitted in the good colleges. So why don't you try to do something about that? So that came in in, I would say, 1954, 1953, 1954. So then the, among us, we were discussing the possibility, and we knew that there were people coming out who had been the director of school, like Father Pino, for instance, had been the head of the school in, in, uh, in China, and I knew about it. And I had also been the director of the school in China when, as a scholastic when I was there. So we said, well, there's a possibility of doing that. So immediately Father O'Brien at that time was a superior, he asked uh, a, a young Jesuit was waiting for his tuitionship if he would not start looking for a possibility of finding a location. You know, start a school, you have to start saying, well, where will it be and uh, what location? So this uh, young priest started looking, and at that time he had his eye on a building that is now the UERM, and that was the Instituto de Mueres, and it was for sale, so he had visited this. But then, just when he was ready almost to conclude the deal with them, he was would, he would sent to Australia with a group of Tertians who had came out, who came out of China. And this is the time when I terminated, finished my, my uh, six years at Chabanel Hall as director, 
that was Pentecost 1955. So then Father O'Brien said, why don't you take over from Father Amyot? Father Amyad is still alive and he is working in, uh, in, Thai, in Bangkok now. He left the Society of Jesus. Not to marry, just because uh, faith, question of faith, I think. Anyway, so I had, this is when I was given that, that the mandate to try to open a, a Chinese school. So I discussed it with Father Pino and I said, okay, why don't we both start working on it? You start working on a curriculum and I will start work looking at the properties that could be found. Then the provincial very generously gave me $2,500, and the nuncio also $2,500. Was it that? Yes, $5,000. At that time was four to one, so I had 20,000 pesos to start the school. <laughs> and I was, when, that, when I was giving that assignment, then I was a, uh, before I left Shabanel, uh, that was maybe two or three months before the change, then I arranged to live with Father Borga, who is a very distant cousin of mine. And uh, so we moved there with Father Pino, and this is where we started planning the school. And I was very jealous of the, of the La Salle College, who has such a nice compound, of the Ateneo de Manila, and then San Beda. I was wearing all my shoes looking for property. How do you find a property in the China area for a school, you know? So one day, it was interesting, I think it's September 1955. I, at that time, I accepted also to take over the, the work that a young Jesuit placer, American who went to Australia for tertianship, had started in Mei Pa Ho. Mei Pa Ho, you know where Mei Pa Ho is, near, uh, near Karaokan, but it's very near also Gagalangin. It's near Gagalangin and uh, Karaokan this month. There was a group of uh, young Christian uh, activists, you know, who started a, a parish there, so they had, they were renting a, a big bodega, and he was saying mass to them, so I had accepted to take over. So when I left uh, Chabanel and I was with uh, Father Borgar in Pasai, I was going there every first Friday for Mass and confession, and every Saturday night and so forth. On that, uh, before the first Friday, I was still in, in the parish. Somebody called me down, it was an old Chinese gentleman, and he said, uh, you don't know me, I know you. You look for property for Chinese school. I find property for you. I said, but where? He said, in uh, Ichagi. I did not know where Ichagi was. He said, take us out in Ichagi. There's a vacant lot there and nobody sees it because there are squatters all around. So if you want, I'll show it to you. So I said, well, what, what would be the price? He said, maybe 50 pesos per square meter. So I said, how big? He said, one hectare and a half. So I said, well, so get rid of him. I said, yes, tomorrow, tomorrow I will go and visit that. So on my way to Meipaho, uh, I stopped there. And then I look at the property, and it was an old uh, sawmill and uh, with a large, huge bodega. And then also a two-story building that used to be hardware store belonging to the, the uh, sawmill, you know, lumber yard. So I said, okay, thank you very much. And then I went to, to say my mass there. And when I was in bed, you know, I was saying, well, very well located. It's not far from the Chinese community. It's free. It's a one hour away, well, say one hectare and a half possibility immediately, you know, of transforming those bodegas into classroom and then the two-story building into a residence for the Jesuit. And then there was a, um, a sawmill that would look like a basketball covered court, you know. So, so that would be nice recreation also. And there was a field also, almost the size of a football field. So when I said, well, that's it, we'll try to do it. So next day I went to see Father Burkhardt and uh, 
I said, uh, what do you think? Well, he said, inquire if it's for sale. So I went to see the owner, and he was telling me that there were 65 co-owners because it was an old Spanish property that had been given from heirs to heirs, you know, so they were nephews and nieces and cousins, and he was the oldest one and the biggest share owner. And he said, I'm authorized to sell, but that's not less than 50 pesos. What is the uh, what is the whole area and how much would that be? So we calculated. They said it would be about seven hundred and eighty thousand, something like that. I said okay. So the next day I called for the Burkhart, and he called the consultors. You know, consultor at that time was the rector of the Scholastic. Inc. So when we met and I explained that I uh, speaking with the owners. He would accept that I we close the deal and I give my twenty thousand pesos as earnest money. Then one hundred thousand pesos before December fifteen or on that day or September fifteen. You know, by September we would buy December fifteen and then January another one hundred thousand to make it two hundred thousand for the uh, initial payments. And then thirty-three thousand every three months for I don't know how long. So I presented that, presented that to the consultants, and the consultants said, "Well, we cannot do that. We don't have that money. How can we raise twenty thousand, uh, eighty thousand pesos from the uh, September fifteenth when you we are supposed to give the earnest money and December fifteenth? Uh, it's too risky." So all the consultants was against except one, I think. So Father Bogart said, the Chinese want the school, they promise to help you, you go ahead, you just buy the property, give your 20,000 pesos earnest money, and if by December 15, 5 o'clock, you don't have the 100,000, then abandon, we will lose our 20,000 pesos, and then we will concentrate in Cebu, and it will be the end of uh, speaking of a Chinese school in Manila. So he took that, that decision. So that's why I was very confident. I said, if the superior shall go ahead and do it, the Lord will help us. So this is when I started to, also with those two Chinese people, start to work on raising money. And then first, where well, we concluded the deal with Mr. Ayala, and I was told that there were two other schools who were trying to get that property. But their bid was less than 50 pesos per square meter. So it was a little less, so I won the bid. The next day, I got a phone call, and the fellow said, we will give you back your 20,000 pesos plus 100,000 if you leave us that property. Not, not even necessarily 100,000, but a, a large amount. So I said, oh, no, uh, that's the only place and site that we had. So this is the way it went. So we start raising money, and the last day, they were, on the December 15, at 2 o'clock, we were short a certain amount, about 30,000 pesos. And then we found a, so if, um, somebody who lend us the money for three years so we can get go ahead and change it. Finally found the location in Echagi. But how did the school go the first few years? The, the school that we started was started by like Father Pino and myself and uh, backed by the Chinese community. We wanted to start the school for answering their needs. And the needs was to give a good Chinese culture to their the students and at the same time uh, a good education uh, or instruction that will allow them to enter college afterwards. So, so we, we found out that the Chinese schools here, everyone, were always co-education. And not, not only that, but they were also uh, starting Chinese first and after two years English. So we had to go against all this. Then we had to also to get permission to start the school. We did not want to start as a Chinese school. We wanted to start as a Filipino school where Chinese is taught, being taught, so that Filipinos also will come. Because what the Chinese were asking also, help us to integrate, you know, to really not only always be educated with our own group, we want to mix with the Filipinos. 
So that was the, the main spirit, which is after I was been, been very well presented here by the uh, by the teachers and so forth. So the objective was what is gone there. Prepare the boys to be for to live in the Philippines in integrated way. So we had to make many decisions. First, we decided that there will be no, there will be no uh, coeducation. That, and that's an interesting story also because at that time, the Archbishop, uh, it was Monsignor Monsignor Santos at that time, was so against coeducation that he would not even allow plays, eh, the the women to play in the, the college or the high school plays. It has to, the role of women had to be played by boys. So that is what uh, we had to fight again. And we got a letter from the nuncio even, Monsignor Vagnozzi at that time, saying, uh, I would advise you to be really co-ed, otherwise you will have no no students. This was, this was, I think, was caused by letters that came from our Chinese desert brothers who were afraid, you know, that we would lose the face completely in front of the Chinese community when we start the school and we have no students, nobody will come because Chinese are accustomed to send boys and girls together. But we said no, we just say boys, even if we have two boys we will start the school and then we will see by the, the training we will give the Chinese will come. So that is true that when the, we started the registration. People would come, you know, two boys, two girls, and then we would say no girls, so they would all go back. Then we had to start also, they have to be at the same level. Even if you come from a Chinese school, if you are two years behind in English, we will have to demote you to the level, the, the lowest level. So this also people were, but many of them did not care. They said no. What we want is the type of education that is given at the Ateneo to be given to our to our boys. So that's the way it went. So the first year we started with about 160 students or something. But then the next year we had, I don't know, exactly four or 600. And the third year, 900. And the fourth year, 1,200. When we moved here, we were 1,200. Father, what was the original name of the school when you first began? We brought Xavier School and Kuang Chi. But we ran more on Kuang Chi because uh, to attract the Chinese. Can you tell us the name, the origin of the name? Well, it comes from Xu Kuang Chi. He's a famous uh, convert from the time of Father Ricci. And uh, he has been known as the, uh, the Jesuit convert. For instance, in, uh, in uh, Shanghai, the big, big uh, uh, area that they call it the, some kind of a Vatican there, is called after his name, eh? Su, Su Jia Hui. So, Su, Su is uh, Su Kuang Chi. Now in Taiwan, our high school also is called Su Hui, after his family name. So, Father, uh, you could ask Father Mina, he made some research on that. He had and written a very nice presentation of the uh, intellectual, good Christian, devoted, generous, turned towards the people. We're interested to do that, to learn about it. By the way, you also involved... Okay. You, you in Haber, uh, Okay, uh, Father, so maybe you can tell us when the move happened, why it happened, and so on and so forth. Well, first a lot, uh, we're talking about our school in in, uh, in Ichagi. It's one and one actor and a half. And uh, the number of students was growing, so Actually, we uh, we were planning, say, we will have to build, uh, like St. Jude, maybe four or five-story building. But in the meanwhile, we were wondering if if really we should go that to that to that level, you know, and that's more lot. Maybe we should stop. But then there was one entrance to the school, you know. The lot was a hidden lot. Eh? It had an access to a, a service road for the stores who were facing Ichagi. So it will enter on the, the, the side of the stores from Pekasan and then the store on Ichagi. Then it would curb and then this is where our property was fenced, you know, with cyclone wire, like when we bought it. And uh, then the service road was for the stores over there, but we, we share 
the entrance. So with all the numbers of cars coming the second, third year, the road was full of holes. So we decided to asphalt it. So I went to see all the stores who, had, who were serviced by that road, if they would share with me. And uh, they all decided, you, you just go ahead and then you come and we will pay you the, the, the whole cost. Huh? So I, was, I went to the first store to collect 1,000 pesos. <coughs> and the fellow said, uh, could you sell me part of your basket, of your football field? You see, on the service road, I wouldn't need that for the bodega. So I told him, I said, not on my dead body. We don't have enough space. But he said, you're not a good businessman. He said, do you know how much it costs you to have a few kids kicking a ball? Your property is worth two million pesos now. Uh, and, uh, and then you are crowded. Why don't you sell your property uh, and then move somewhere else? But I said, well, just we're still building a <coughs> few classrooms. Well, he said, it's up to you. But he said, it's a bad investment to have uh, uh, kids <laughs> kicking up uh, footballs on, on the, that, cost, that uh, expensive property. So I said, well, okay, we will take it over. And then he said, but if you sell, you let me know. I will buy part of it. So I went, and when I was walking back, you know, I was saying, maybe that's a good idea, you know. So I stopped it. Father, P Father Pino had an office right, on, on the other side of the football field near, near the basketball court. And I stopped at his room, and I said, uh, Cornelius, what do you think we sell that property here and move somewhere else? He looked at me, he said, John, I told you all the time, wear a hat when you go under the sun. So, <laughs> you're becoming crazy. After all the problems, we had to find that property. But I said, you take it over. So after a while, we talk about it during meals, you know, and he said, well, maybe, but we have to find a property before we sell it, otherwise we'll be playing the musical chair. So this is when I started looking for property. But in that, then I started reading about what kind of land or ground you want when you start the school. So everybody was saying, try to get rolling ground so that they could be drained easily and that, and that they were flooded. So I started looking for rolling grounds for the property. And I was driving one afternoon with Basilio King, one of the two Chinese who was helping us. And we were passing in front of the entrance of uh, Ortigas Avenue from Edza. And it was open only two lanes at that time until La Salle College was there built already. And then to that entrance I could see far away a big mango tree, you know, on top of a hill. So I said, stop, you stop. I said, what about that hill there? It was all coke and grass, you know, in Carabout fields. There was nothing at all there. So, well, he said, we can go. So we turned around, we went to, to uh, Shaw Boulevard, and then San Juan, and we parked in front of where would be the, actually the lot that uh, is between Ica, and, but on the other side of the, of the river. There was no bridge, no whatsoever. So we forged the, the stream there on stone, and the hill started from, the, from, the, from that level up to where the residence of the Jesuit, the old residence is. And there was, was the, uh, the mango tree, a big mango tree. So we climbed this and we looked at it. And I could see, you know, the whole thing, all clear, no building, no road, no nothing. I said, see, this is the place, huh? So we would find out who owned that by asking the people. They said it was Mandaluyung Estate, Ortigas, Madrigal. So we found the office was very near the entrance to Wak Wak Club. We went there, and there we met with the, the, the owner, the Ortigas there, the youngest one, Arturo. And he said, yes, we own everything from the Pasig River up to Santo Land and up to Camp Crame and even Santa Lucia, we just finished selling. That was an old, old Spanish estate given to the, the family. So I, and he had a development plan. So I said, well, where is that hill? So he showed it to us. So I said, could you make a, a, a we would like to buy 15 hectares, you know. 
But first he said, well, you make sure how much you want, but he said, we could arrange it, and I would like to have a street around. Now much I asked for the price. He said, well, the price is 10 pesos per square meter. But he said, you have to speak to the company, maybe they, they can cut it for you. So then anyway, afterwards we got the plan, and then the superiors were saying, not 15 hectares, five, five hectares. So then we went back and he prepared the plans. Then I, I put this, I want a street, four lanes all around, then the sidewalk. And, and uh, this is when it was funny because the old uh, Ortiga said, you know, when we sell the property, we're the one putting conditions, not you. Huh? But I said, Mr. Ortiga, when you buy a pair of pants, is it the tailor who tells you the length of your pants? No, so you laugh. I said, okay, that's what I'm telling you. I want the streets there and so forth. And two bridges, eh? the band that are there now. Then I'll bring water to the property. And then that's it for open the, the road around. The rest it was for them. But I don't want the, the, uh, the property on Ortigas. I want at least one block from Ortigas because of the traffic. We already knew the traffic jam on the Chagi. And that's the way it developed. Then I had to tell the sisters, if you want to buy a property, you better buy now, otherwise you will pay much more. So they, the provincial there was saying, the mother general will kill me. We just finished building in Tramuros, and now we are moving to, uh, to that place. They did not know where it was. It was wasteland here, you know, at that time. From Santo land, we would see all old Kogan grass, carabao fields. There was nothing until military camps. Huh? So that's the way it went. Huh? Okay, so how old is Saver School now? How old is? Is it the school? The school. It started in 1956, huh? mm -hmm. but we moved here in 1958. Uh, 1959, yes, 1959. December 29, so 40 years we are here now. How, how would you assess the how the school has been in the last 40 years, Father? I think the school uh, grew very nicely. Eh? Even during uh, our time with Father Pinot, it developed very nicely. We, we built the whole thing for 2,500 kids, and we figured out with this area. First we had five hectares, then it was too small, so I told Father Onyati, I'm buying two and a half more hectares, so make it the size it is now. Uh, but uh, it was built for 2,500, and then it, it grew, it developed. Eh? And I, I think it's, uh, it's marvelous the way it developed. Eh? What do you think is the most important contribution of the school to the Chinese Filipino community? What do what, I think? What do you think is the most uh, valuable contribution of the school in your in the, the years of its existence, Father? <laughs> to tell you the truth, I believe that the foundation of the school helped change almost completely the opinion that the Chinese community had about the Catholic school, about the Catholic Church. I think for me this is one of the greatest things that has happened. Because when we were starting the school, we knew that the, the businessmen, the non-Catholics, they have no respect for the church in the Philippines. They didn't know what it's all about. But then when they saw the type of education that was given here, the importance of it, and then the way they were treated, I think. And not only that, but our students, the graduate students, who graduated and had become real Catholics, eh? then that changed the mentality completely of the Chinese population. That's why the Chinese apostolate became a possibility and a growing possibility. Eh? And this is also what facilitated the... Uh, and that was the same with, I think, St. Jude eh? and St. Peter. And so the, the mentality changed. This, the, the Catholic Church was not concerned with them before, and had nothing, practically nothing to do with them. Changed that is one of the, the greatest thing. And not only that, but also the number of Catholics that are enrolled in the school. When we started, it was a very small percentage of the Catholics, non-Catholics. But uh, now it's the majority who are Catholic. 
then towards the integration, I think there's still a lot to, to be done, but uh, certainly the, it has happened with the Filipinos who, uh, who studied here. Hmm? Father, in your years here in, in Manila, in the Philippines, what would you, is there any particular experience that you consider you know, the most unique or most uh, satisfying? Um, well, certainly, Bob, but the fact that we could, even the language school, you know, for me, when you look at the people like Zuluaga, Mena, uh, and Cortina, and all the others, and even now the Chinese seminarians who stayed there and started parishes and school of their own in the provinces, I think that that is a, a real blessing. Now, Father Bernas, I think, wrote a marvelous elegy about Father uh, Atutegi. Father Bernard. Yeah. And at the end, he said, you know, Mao Zedong did not realize what he was doing. But by, by uh, sending us, all those Chinese missionaries from here, has given the church here in the Philippines a tremendous boost. And it's very well written, his article there on the chat. Can, can I just ask you to repeat what you said so that we can, we can use it more? Mm -hmm. Can I just ask you to repeat what you said about Father Bernard's article on Father Chutubi? Well, Father Bernard wrote, it's, uh, I, when I read it, I did not know that Chutubi had been such a, uh, a personality here in the Philippines, which all his apostolate, and especially the history of the uh, Aglipayan and all the churches like that. So at the end, the last paragraph, uh, you could read it uh, yourself, it's very well said. He said, Mao Zedong did not realize what he was doing, but he was certainly God's instrument to send to the Philippines people who changed the mentality of, uh, of the, uh, not change the mentality, but to give a tremendous boost to the Catholic Church. But it's very well said, better than what I'm saying now. Okay, Father, anything else you want to add? Um, after spending all these years in Manila, what, what, is there anything to look forward to? as far as the apostolate of the Jesuits among the Chinese Filipinos? Well, I think it, uh, the, the uh, meeting that uh, was held, you know, at uh, Novali Chess last month, I think, is very significant. And I think it's, if they really create a commission, they will work on it. But uh, it's, a, it's a real apostolate, and I think it's doing very well, very, very well. The fact that uh, the trouble is that there is no more personnel to be dedicated to that unless we take it seriously, mm -hmm. which I believe Cardinal Sin take, uh, takes it very seriously. He himself created that seminary of Lorenzo Ruiz Mission Seminary, mainly I think to for thinking that he might send somebody to mainland China, but he knows very well it would be much more important to, to keep doing it here. Huh? Well, there are a lot of people, I uh, should say that whenever they they spend uh, their years working for uh, a particular community and giving of themselves. They receive also something in return. In your experience, in your own personal, uh, on a personal note, what would you consider the most valuable thing that you have received after having played such a significant role in the apostolate of the Jesuits among the Chinese Filipinos here? <laughs> I would say, that I, I, if I would have been here somewhere else, I would probably have had the same thing. Huh? It's just uh, that I grew up and, like you said, what did I get? Well, first I came here for the nine, so, but I've not been here 50 years. Huh? So from here I went to Vietnam, and from the experience I got in Vietnam was terrific also. Then it changed completely my the orientation of my own apostolate, eh? because I went into communication there. And being in communication, then I was c connected with the international organizations. So I became the general secretary, first the assistant general secretary of UNDA, the uh, International Catholic Association for Radio and Television, with the mandate of creating UNDA, or starting UNDA in the whole uh, Pacific Ocean. There was nothing except Australia. Australia used to meet with UNDA Asia. So we started everything in all those small islands there, helping develop radio program and television program, which is still going on very nicely. Uh, so after that, I became the general secretary and based in, in Brussels. There I got tremendous also uh, impact, you know, from uh, Universal Church, working with the 
at the level of the president was Father Angelus Andrew, one of the best broadcasters they had at the BBC at the time for religion. So I lived in Brussels, which I acquired experience there. Then after that, I also was connected with the starting of the Center for the Research of Communication and Culture in London. I was at the beginning, I was invited, because I was in Vietnam, I was invited by Father Arupe to participate to the meeting where he was throwing his ideas. You know. Arupe was a tremendous genius in finding the real apostolate. He wanted to see how can we train every Jesuit to be a communicator so that uh, w if we could only get Jesuit who would occupy the place of an uh, anchorman on the news of the world, for instance. Eh? So we should try to prepare them. Why don't you tell us about the first Filipino you met in your life? The first Filipino I met is Father Horacio de la Costa. And uh, afterwards, you know, the, when the people who helped me start the school were very close friends of de la Costa, Basilio King and uh, Ambrose Chu. They were calling him Chisik or something like that. This nickname, I don't know. Anyway, I was, uh, as I, told, I said, I was studying at Harvard, killing time, actually, uh, sinology and language. And he was finishing his PhD on the history of the Far East. And uh, once I went to his room, and he was typing. <coughs> <coughs> this girl fellow was typing his doctoral thesis directly with six copies. Eh? directly, as part of his thesis were his, uh, uh, what you call that, paper, term papers that he had to, to bring in. So when he was type, typing, I could not imagine that that's the way he was doing his thesis, directly on the typewriter. And uh, because the, the man has a clear, clear mind. Eh? We became quite close friends because, as I was saying, we were the only two non-Americans there. So we were ganging together against the others. But uh, I did not know at that time that I would come in the Philippines. So when I came to the Philippines, then I heard his name everywhere because he was already uh, well known and uh, look, looking for. But after that, in the Philippines, I had very few contacts with him. But when he came, he, we, he was not in the same place where I was working. I was working many more with uh, the uh, other column and the, this group there. And, and then uh, after I came here, after I finished Xavier and I went to Vietnam, I came back here and I was three years at the Bureau of Asian Affairs. At that time he was not uh, connected with that, but then he became provincial, then I had some relation with him there. The Father, when you knew him, when you lived with him in Boston, what were, what do you, would you consider would be some of his, uh, you know, more important qualities as a person? Well, he's, uh, well, first intellectually, tremendously well gifted, no, and you could you could see that, and a very nice relationship with the others. But uh, I was I had great admiration for him. But there were many other people there, and Bob who were also almost at the same level. Intellectually, it was amazing to see that. Uh, but so I could not really tell you that at that time I had no idea of who really he was. Uh, I just only remember that once I was in the library and uh, two two Americans came to me and he said, uh, "You are very close to Father to Father de la Costa. What is his nationality? We are discussing that here." So I said, what do you think? Well, some were saying he's Chinese, other one says he's Malaysia, he's from Singapore. No one was thinking of the Philippines. <laughs> so that's the only thing I remember. But he, and you, you could know that he was, he was highly esteemed by the people of this class. Huh? So, okay, thank you very much, Father. Thank you very much for your, for the you are most welcome. <laughs>